Boom! Good morning, everybody. Happy Sunday, everybody. Episode eight. Welcome to episode eight. Welcome to the replay. If you're watching this on the replay, how the heck are y'all? You can fast forward to the nine nine minutes, five minute mark. That's usually when I get started. After my hellos, how's everyone doing? Ruth McCool is here watching. Lee Shepard is watching. Put your comments in. This is YouTube right there. Lee Shepard, Santa Monica, California. How the heck are y'all? Please hit the share button. Please hit the like button. Please hit the subscribe button. Dr. V here, world-famous bariatric surgeon. I am now retired, author of 13 books, five motivational journals. Um, here to deliver some knowledge, you know? I just got back from uh, one of my friend and mentor's events called Secret Knock. His name is Greg Reed. You should give him a follow. It was amaze balls. We'll talk about that a little bit. Lori Bloom is back. Put your get just follow my post. If it says Facebook user, you can put in your um, just give them permission and you'll show up uh, like this, like Thelma. Hold on, like this, like Maria. <laughs> YouTube is in the house. Look at this, Doctor. What's up, global audience indeed. Rose Marie, how are you? Terror Darnell, what's up? All right, Yin Yang's watching. Look at all these regulars. Denise Henry, hit the share button, everybody. If your profile shows up like this, Facebook user, go give your uh, give permission to uh, StreamYard, and you you can get mentioned like this. Alice Forehand, good morning, Christine K, Kimberly. Now you guys are popping in. Uh oh, Rosemary's working. Look at everybody, Mike Carlos. Good morning, everybody. Angela Garza. So just real quick, I, I don't like to get political on these, but I'm going to tell you uh, something that's super important. You guys need to understand. There's about 50 of y'all watching on all platforms. And this I'm I'm not a political person. I'm not a Republican. I'm not a Democrat. I'm not an independent. Right. So. <clears throat> But in my private group, I've been telling um, my people that um, the government will always pass the spending bill. They have to. And you have to understand why this is the case. The spending bill is how the, how the economy works. When government spends money, that is how the economy works. Period. End of story. And it doesn't matter if they're red or they're blue Every government has to pass a thing bill. So I've been telling them all of these shenanigans they've been playing this last um, year with a speaker and all that sort of, I said, it doesn't matter. They're going to pass these bills. So the, the news pumps this up like, oh, there's going to be a government shutdown, yada, yada. And guess what? The Senate passes it um, late last night or Friday night or whatever, averting a shutdown. So now we won't have a government shutdown. But here's the key. The bill that they passed was $1.2 trillion. I mean, we were throwing around the T word like nothing now. And we don't seem to understand that a billion is 1,000 million and a trillion is 1,000 billion. It's just so much ridiculous money. Your dollars are going to be worth nothing, I want to tell you. So, um, so $1.2 trillion, and that does not include aid to Ukraine and aid to Israel. It doesn't matter what you believe. They will pass that. So if they ended up passing that, I, I think they know that the American people could not handle $2 trillion bill, spending bill. But that's what's going to happen. Because once they add in all of the um, Ukraine aid, I mean, that's going to be 120 billion or 200 billion. War to Israel, another 100 billion. Pork belly shit. It's going to be another five, six, seven, eight hundred billion dollar bill, which will make it two trill two trillion dollars. And and they just know that we won't deal with it. You know, so. This is just all shenanigans. People get so bugged and bothered, up in arms, et cetera, et cetera. And 
Um, there's nothing we can do about it except for you, for you to understand that it's just free money. It's, it's, it's going, it's not going to go anywhere. I mean, it's only going to go back to the government if you don't take it. Right. So I'll give you an example. A couple of years ago, um, Erica's little town, Las Vegas, New Mexico, um, had really bad wildfires all around it. It wasn't close to my ranch, but all around it, it totally smoke and mirrors. And, um, and, uh, they were in an evacuation zone. It was only a couple miles from Erica's grandmother's house. And at the time I was remodeling, uh, there, there are three homes on her property and I was remodeling one of them <clears throat> and, um, and, uh, they had to evacuate. And then two weeks ago, I mean, this was two years ago, but just two weeks ago, my real estate agent said, did you ever apply for government aid for smoke damage to that yellow house? I said, no, what is that? He goes, oh, you can apply for smoke damage. Like smoke damage? They're like, yeah. What? He goes, yeah. If you were in an evacuation zone, you qualify. And it's something, it's a lot. It's like, I don't know, 30 grand. So I said, send me the link, baby. I'm going to, I'm going to go get some money. Yeah. It's my money. It's our money. Anyway, it's not even our money. It's deficit spending. So it's made out of thin air. So everyone's like, okay. So there, I was having this discussion in my, in my private group about, you know, the spending bill and stuff and people will get angry. Dr. V, why are you so cool? Cause I don't get angry. People get angry and be like, those are your tax dollars. They're spending my tax dollars. Uh, no, they're not. <laughs> you, do you understand this? They're, they're printing money out of thin air. It's not your tax dollars. If you had to count on tax dollars, we wouldn't, our economy would collapse. There's not enough tax dollars. There's not enough tax base to do all of the bullshit that the government does, which is mostly the, in, the war industrial complex, if you really want to know. So I know I can't control it. I know they're going to print it anyway. So one, I decided I'm not going to get angry about it. Two, I decided I better go get my own. I better go get it. All right. So we're at the seven and a half minute mark. Let me get started. I'm a little bit behind, but that was a little digression. Good morning, everybody. Dr. Dr. Vong here, world famous bariatric surgeon, author of 13 books. Um, welcome to Sunday Coffee with Dr. V. I've actually been awake since 5.30. <laughs> It's not, it's 9 a.m. currently, and I'm actually done with coffee. But, but uh, yeah, comment if you ever get to that point where you, after a couple of cups of coffee, you start to taste the bitterness. It gets really kind of puckery in your mouth, and you're like, I'm done. I'm done with coffee. I don't really feel the weight. I've been up since 5.30. We're going to talk about how do you feel fulfilled. I have to give you... A little bit of a background story. So this last week, uh, I was in San Diego at a conference called Secret Knock. My friend and mentor, Greg Reed, runs this event. And it is, and I've been to a lot of motivational events. Secret Knock is always off the chain, always great people. Uh, you can't go unless you know somebody and you get an invite uh, and you have to talk to them. They have to vet you out, et cetera, et cetera. Room full of great people not so mostly entrepreneurs but not all entrepreneurs you have some people that are just regular regular folk and um so always have fun always f having fun catching up with people always have fun making new friends new acquaintances and then always get rejuvenated to go back and do my thing chicken wing right so this time um we erica's mom flew flew in from new mexico and babysat the girls, Eric and I have a um, seven year old, I mean, second grader Mason. So she's seven and a half and then a 11 month old, soon to be one year old baby Milani. And so her mom took Mason to school every day, picked her up, you know, watched the baby, fed the baby, et cetera, et cetera. And we got to have some mommy daddy time in San Diego at this conference. It was great. Made new friends. So do you guys remember Seinfeld? Comment if you ever watched uh, Seinfeld. 
And if you did watch Seinfeld, which I, you know, must see TV Thursday nights, remember that? I used to watch Seinfeld all the time. What was your favorite episode or one of the most uh, popular episodes of Seinfeld you've ever seen? Like, what, what did you really like? What did you like? My favorite one was actually Lobster Hands. Remember that woman with the huge hands that Jerry dated? Uh, there's a two-faced woman. All right. So so De Deanna says, no soup for you. Donna Bess says, soup Nazi. I'm out. The whole, that was funny. Like when they tried to see how long they could go without masturbating. We got a lot for the soup Nazi. That's awesome. Elaine's dancing, right? So, so um, they were talking at the conference, like, what was your favorite Seinfeld episode? And I shouted out, lobster hands, lobster hands. Everyone else shouted out, soup Nazi. And they panned to the back of the room, and there he was, the soup Nazi. Um, his name is Larry Thomas. He plays the soup Nazi. And they brought him up on stage, and they're talking about, you know, his career as Seinfeld and soup Nazi. So uh, later that evening, I, I take my table to dinner. So just so you know, Dr. V holds court. <laughs> I have lunch and dinner, invite only, and I have my table. And some other table come in with some other friends. I said, why don't you join us? And there he is, Larry Thomas, comes and sits down two seats from me, the soup Nazi. I forgot, I forgot to see what he was eating. <laughs> uh, the close talker. Oh my God, that one was annoying for me. So, so, uh, so he says hello and, and I, and I, I pay for the whole table. I paid for my table and the next table that came and there was probably 22 people. So we're walking back. Um, and, uh, he asked me what I did. I told him what I did. And I said, but you know what I'm doing is I'm buying this bed and breakfast. And I, and I show him my pictures of the bed and breakfast I'm going to buy. In case you don't know, I'm buying a bed and breakfast uh, an hour outside of Santa Fe in Pecos, New Mexico, for all of my followers in New Mexico, my patients in New Mexico. I'm coming back. We're moving there. We're running there. We're gonna, I'm going to remodel it. It's currently a bed and breakfast, and um, we're going to run it and remodel the original 1963 cabin, do some upgrades, all sorts of stuff. But we're gonna live there and run it. So I showed Larry pictures of it. And uh, he goes, a soup Nazi. And he says, uh, oh my gosh, my girlfriend would love to come there. I said, bro, I got you. I said, uh, let's stay in touch. And uh, we'll, we'll get you out. The next day, we're sitting next to each other at the conference. Uh, the last night, it's so funny. We we go to dinner. You know, we we go to we see we went we went to a piano bar the second night. Third night we went for tacos late at night, and then we ended up back in Larry's room. And there's a group of us, and he's just talking, telling us stories about Seinfeld and what he's doing now. So I'm totally hanging out with the soup Nazi. So by the way, the soup Nazi is now a good friend of mine. <laughs> I have like oh uh, like uh, his phone number and everything like that. And he's going to come stay at the bed and breakfast. There's a lot of other things that happen. And there's a reason why I'm telling you guys this secret knock thing. Is um, So my friend Chuck Ebert, who's an eight-time Grammy, no Grammy-nominated artist and three-time winner. He's won three Grammys. Um, business partner. He's, he has a distillery. He All sorts of stuff. Anyway, he goes, Doc. He goes, I brought in a secret knock this year. He goes, Doc, I have this band. They're amazing. I'm taking them to the Grammys this year. They are so ready. So um, so he says, uh, um, so we, we bring, we, we bring, it's a band called Hold Fast. Hold Fast. And they're three, it, they're a three-piece band. Um, the drummer and the bass player are brothers. And the lead singer and, and guitar is um, a cousin who's half Chinese, by the way. Interesting. They are fantastic. They're, they sound so good. It was just so much fun. So I had a long time talking to them. I'm going to be their, their mental, mental mindset coach. It's kind of redundant. 
but their mindset coach. Uh, who else did I meet that was interesting? Um, Amica, have you guys seen this Amica, the robot? Who's, you know, she doesn't have emotions, but she had, the facial expressions are crazy. So got to interview and talk with Amica, the robot. That was really interesting. I know just a lot of stuff. Jeff, Jeff Hoffman, you know, the inventor, the founder of Priceline.com. Actually, Jeff Hoffman also um, brought us the, the kiosk uh, at airports where you ticketing kiosk, where you get your tickets. That's price. That's Priceline guy. He did that too. Um, and it's pretty, it's pretty crazy. She's totally funny. Yeah. Amica is totally funny. And, <laughs> and they try to use the pronoun they to refer to Amica, but they often default to uh, she. Well, why am I telling you all this stuff? One, there's another secret knock in September in Vegas, which he never takes it out. Greg never takes it out of San Diego. I don't know why he's, he's taking it. About five years ago, he took it to LA and he said, I'm never doing that again. It's always in San Diego. But for whatever reason, the next one in September is... Um, in Vegas. Anyway, they're five thousand dollars seat tickets. I can get it to you for twenty five hundred bucks, but I'll tell you more about that later. So, how to like how to become fulfilled? So, Erica and I, um, we're I'm I'm actually leaving after this to the airport because I'm going to Albuquerque and to Pecos tomorrow. I'm supposed to go. We're supposed to have inspections uh, for the bed and breakfast, but they're supposed to get some snow tonight and maybe tomorrow morning. So I'm a little bit worried that they'll cancel the inspections, but that's okay. I'm gonna go anyway. I was thinking about canceling my trip, but I said, no, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna take some snow pictures of the bed and breakfast in the snow, the field. So we'll have winter pictures, well, spring, summer pictures. And um, I was up late last night and, and this morning I started watching uh, chicken catch, like recipes on how to cook chicken cacciatore. And I was like, man, I hadn't made this in a long time. I totally forgot about it. I said, maybe I should make that for dinner tonight. And then I was like, um, but it's kind of similar to something I already, I just cooked last night. And I was like, it's yeah, chicken but blah, 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 or mashed potatoes, be delicious. And then I realized like, wait a minute, I won't be here tonight. I'll be in Albuquerque. So then I started thinking, man, what am I doing? Like, do I, like, I, I miss my kid. We were gone last week. Alani's growing up. She's starting to stand up on her own. Mason's so witty and funny. And and like, are you having like second thoughts about buying the bed and breakfast? No, no, no. What's it going to be like living? Like, I'm not, I don't like the cold. I like the mountains, but I don't like the cold. I don't like to ski. I don't like cold, wet feet. Okay, here's my thing. I don't like cold, wet feet. So comment if you don't like cold, wet feet. So I never snowed because, you know, as a surgeon, if I could, if I broke my wrist or something, if I fell or uh, that would be really bad. So I, I never learned to ski. Besides that, I know everyone's like, no, you get really hot in those suits. And, and I grew up really poor. So the idea of buying like this expensive, you know, like ski outfit and, and sled and skis and stuff like that, like, I couldn't bring myself to do. So I'm not a skier. So I started thinking like, man, I'm going to be like, in cold weather for half of the year. Do I really want that? Right. And so I started thinking like a lot of people come, would come to visit just like an Island, like Caribbean Island. There are people who actually live in Fiji, people who actually live in the Bahamas and people go on their vacation. And then, you know, you go home and you wish you were living in Fiji in the Bahamas and the people in the Bahamas are like, man, it's so hot and sweaty here. I wish, um, I wish I could go be in the mountains, et cetera, et cetera. So we're, we're listening to a video about Michael Singer in my private group today. Michael Singer is the author of Untethered Soul. It's a great book. If you've never read it, I highly recommend you read Untethered Soul. So what, so what is it you really want? And in today's video, he, he talks about this. He goes, imagine if I, if I were to ask you, what do you really want? And I'm sure some people would say, man, Doc, I, I would love to have like a relationship, someone who loves me, cares about me, take care of me, et cetera. Or you might write down money or finances or, you know, retirement or travel. What do you really want? 
actually put this in. Let's do this. Put, put it in the comment section. Comment right now. I'll put it up on screen. What do you really want? Right? What is it you really want? I want to travel more. I want more money. And don't be one of those people. Money don't make you happy. That's why you don't have it. <laughs> what is it you really, really want in life? You know, I want to see. My, I want to spend more time with my kids. Uh, I want to travel. I want to football. You know, and I'll pop that up. Um, here we go. So he wants to go home to Hawaii. Tommy, uh, Rose, Ann wants relationship, travel, marriage. See, it's so funny. Sad guru, my guru. He says, um, he says, uh, oh, that's not good husband and money he says man if you're single you want a husband and you and then if you're single you're, you're suffering because you want a husband if you're married and you're suffering a different way if you're young you're suffering because you're young and you wish you were older if you're older you wish you were, you were suffering because you wish you were younger if you were poor you're suffering your poverty if you're rich, you're suffering paying taxes and bills and, and people wanting to get your stuff. If you're single, you're suffering your loneliness. If you're married, it's a whole nother suffering. <laughs> um, what I really want to know is what I want. No one can tell you, Sue, except for you. I want a knee replacement. Both knees. People who've had their knees replaced are like, man, you know, like, here you go. I want financial freedom. Yes, very good, doctor. Um, <laughs> this is funny. Marriage is a three ring circus engagement ring, re wedding ring, and suffer ring. Uh, travel, friendship, travel. Okay. So, so he says you go outside and you see this burning bush. And the burning bush says, I am your Lord, your God. Tell me what you want and I will grant it to you. And you believe that's really, really God. And you say, God, and for this example, I'll say uh, you want a relationship. I want someone who will love me and take care of me and always be faithful with me and all that sort of stuff, right? And uh, God says, okay, um, I, I can grant that for you. But, or money or finances, anything you want. He goes, but I want you to know, I will get you this person that super successful, super good looking, tall, dark, and handsome, whatever you want, light and blonde, tall, dark, and whatever you want. That will take care of you, that will dote on you, that will cook for you, that will clean the house, that will, everything you want, everything you want. He goes, but there's a catch, and you need to know about this catch. And the catch is, even though you will be with this person, you will not feel good inside. You'll love them. You'll go through the steps of being lustful and horny and passionate, all that stuff. But you won't be happy inside. You won't feel good inside. Is that what you want? And you think about it for a little bit, and then you finally realize, no, that's not, that's not what I want. That's not what I want. No, I want a partner and I want to feel good. And that's what we're going to talk about today is because like, like, how do you get fulfilled? You know, that's the thing. Aren't there poor people who are miserable? Aren't there rich people who are miserable? Of course there are rich people. Who are miserable. Aren't there poor people who commit suicide because they can't take it? Aren't there rich people who jump out of buildings because the stock market just crashed? Of course there are. Can't take it. So that can't be it. That's not the case. So, you know, being handsome, aren't there aren't there supermodels and celebrities who who think they look ugly? Aren't there disfigured people, burn victims, or just born ugly that wish they were more attractive? Yeah. Right? So that's not the right answer. Like, well, if I was more handsome, then I'd start doing lives and I could make money and then I would be happy. Well, <laughs> there are people like that and they, they, 
they're still not happy. So that can't be the key. So what I really want Dr. V is to be content. What I really want Dr. V is to have peace inside. What I really want Dr. V is, you know, to have all my wishes fulfilled. Well, no. Haven't you ever been happy? And let's say you're getting ready, you wake up, you, you had a good night's sleep. And, uh, and you think and you put on your outfit, you put on your makeup, right? And you think you think you look cute that day. You just feel cute. You get in your car, you drive to work, you're, you're right on time, maybe even a little bit early. And then all you see in front of you, a bunch of red lights, brake lights. You're stuck in traffic. It is a dead stop. And you're like, nah, nothing's going to ruin my day today. I, I'm happy. And then it just drags on and on. And then you start to realize, dude, I'm going to be late. I'm going to be late. And now you're not good inside. And it's due to fucking traffic. Something you have no control over. Let's say another scenario. You wake up early. You feel good. You look cute. You put on your yellow dress. And uh, you, you think you look great. And you walk into your office building. And one, like everybody, one after another says to you, Oh my God, you look so cute. You look so cute. You're yellow. I love your yellow dress. I love your yellow dress. And let's say 10, 12, 15, 100, 1,000 people tell you you look cute. And then suddenly, one person looks at you and says, Hey, good morning. You know your uh, shoes don't match your dress, right? Like, and you're like, What? And now how do you feel? For the rest of the day, you are constantly thinking about, oh my God, I'm an idiot. My belt does not match my shoes, that does not match my dress. What was I thinking? Am I right? Comment if you've ever had this experience before. And you totally forgot about the 10, 20, 100,000 people before who told you you were cute. And you only remember that one person who pointed out that your belt does not match your shoes. And now for the rest of the day, you are miserable. You are suffering. You are in your head. You are thinking about it, right? But everything else in your life is amazing. You love your job. You love your marriage. Your kids are good. They're not on drugs. They all have their teeth. Your car is cute. You got a new car. Everything's great, except for the rest of the day, you are unhappy because of one comment one person said to you. I'm not good. Right? So, I was there at Secret Knot having a great time, dancing all out, getting inspired, getting motivated. Walked around, because I'd done this before, you know? And sitting here thinking, like, looking at people's eyes, faces, like, how many of them are in their heads? How many of them are, are, feel, are feeling self-conscious? How many of them are thinking they don't belong there because they're not good enough? How many of them think they, they're wasting their time because they're all they've already learned all this stuff? How many of them there think that, oh my God, this person sitting next to me is so good looking and I'm just so ordinary, right? So how many people are sitting there at dinner with me going, man, how am I going to pay for this? Like it's $50 an entree or whatever. Like, oh, I'm just going to order the soup and salad and maybe get out of there like for 15, 20 bucks. And then how many of them are relieved that I picked up the bill? Yet how many of them are upset that I picked up the bill? Right? So Michael Singer says the problem is we have, write this down. We suffer. Tip number one. I'm writing all caps so it sticks out. This is why we suffer. We are basically suffering our preferences. <clears throat> if they're not tall and dark and handsome. Have you had a friend who said this like, oh my God, he's so not my type. I, I can't believe it. He's just so not my type. And, and, 
and but I really like this guy. So, so if he if he had met you last year, you would not have given him any time or attention because you preferred tall, dark, and handsome to light and blonde. You know what I mean? We what what are you suffering? You're suffering your preferences. What about youth, Doctor V? Youth is suffering. Like I wish I had it. Like my preference would be I wish I was already there. I wish I was already done with school. I wish I already had money. Can I have an aha? Um, if you're older and you have money and you have success, you're suffering your preference of being younger and more attractive and having more time. I wish I had more time to enjoy my cars or my house or my yacht or whatever, right? Um, my preference is I want, I like my soups hot until you realize you go to a conference and they give you something called gazpacho and gazpacho is basically soup, but it's cold. And then you go, ugh, I don't want cold soup. And then you taste it and you go, oh my God, this is delicious. I make this killer tomato, cucumber, gazpacho. Mm. Right? But until you tasted it, you were suffering. Like, I don't want cold soup or ceviche. Or uh, this this week, last week at Secret Night, I ordered some agua chile. Which, if you don't know what agua chile is, it's a Latin American dish that's basically like ceviche, but it's raw shrimp cooked in lime juice. Uh, and if they don't, do it right. If they don't clean the shrimp right, it smells very shrimpy, which I've had before. And I'm like, ooh, if they do it right, it's delicious. <clears throat> but people suffer this preference like, oh, I don't like my appetizers cold. I don't like raw stuff. I don't like sushi. I don't like a buff until you taste it. And even the first time you taste it, you know, it's um, it's off. It's it's been studied. You have to taste something 18 times, 18 times on average before you can say that you like it or really don't like it. So this whole idea of I tried oysters before once, twice, three times, I don't like them. You know what I mean? So what are we suffering, man? We suffer our preferences. Now think about this. Well, it was does have to do with like, how, how do you become fulfilled? How to be fulfilled? So now we have to like take step number two which is you have to start, you know, uh, one of my other friends and mentors, David Corbin says, you know, sunlight is the best um, disinfectant. You have to illuminate, not cover up. You have to put things out there in the sunlight to look at it. You need to start questioning your preferences. Why do I feel this way? Right? Why, why do I like tall, dark, and handsome? when I just really want someone to be kind to me, you know? The joke when I was younger was like, I had the string, I'm not bragging, but string of like, I, I had a very clear preference for blondes. <laughs> uh, and now I'm with a you know, pretty hot Latina. And and um, and Erica always gets mad because I, I, I call her like a little Mexican, which I know she's not. She's, she's, she's mostly, I don't know, fifth, I don't know. 50% native, 50% Spanish. And by Spanish, I mean from Spain. And another like 8% Portuguese, which is like one, like one part borders Spain, right? The top part of Spain. And, uh, and, uh, and then a smattering of other little countries, which I know 110%. So, uh, like, why, why do I feel that way? I was talking earlier about, like, why why are some people, like, I like math and science. And if you love math and science, and there's a Malcolm Gladwell talk, and you love it. There's a Neil, Neil deGrasse Tyson is giving a talk. You want to go. But if you're not into math and science, you, you're like, that's the last place I want to go is the, you know, the Arboretum or the, you know, the... The observatory. 
But if there's a art exhibit, I'd love to go. And then if you're not, if you don't know anything about art, then you're and you're a math or science guy, you kind of or gal, you go, oh, last thing I don't want to play is boring art museum. Why is that? Well, Dr. V, I'm left brain, I'm right brain. You know, there was a time before that we didn't have that notion of left brain, right brain. Did you realize that? Like left brain, right brain has only, someone kind of look it up. It's only been since I want to say the 70s, maybe 60s, 70s, when they discovered that. Before that, for the, for the previous 300,000 years of human evolution, we didn't have this idea that I'm left brain, I'm right brain. So I'm, I like math and science. And it's actually not even really true. I mean, it's like a slight leaning, but just because you're right brained or left brain doesn't mean that you're exclusive to one or the other. It's just, it's been corrupted in culture anyway, in Facebook memes. So, you know, I like to travel. I don't like, to, do you know anyone who doesn't like to travel? I love to travel. I don't, I mean, I like to be at home too. But you know, there are these homebodies that swear to God, like they swear they hate to travel. Well, you, you've just never traveled with Dr. V or you never traveled with Bunny or you never, you know, or maybe you're living off of experiences of staying in youth hostels and stuff like that. Like, all right, I may fucking stay in a youth hostel. You know, I'm not, have you, do you know these people who travel to a different state or different area to, to the Bahamas or to Vegas or to France? And they just, they'll have McDonald's or pizza. And you say, why? And they'll say, well, this is what I like. And you go, no, it's really just all you can afford. It's not the same. So, 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 so question, you're like, why do I have this preference for fast food? Oh, it's because I don't know how to cook. Oh, it's what I grew up on. It's oh, like, or it's, you're just, you just haven't had the good shit yet. So you have questioning preferences. So, so now you start pre questioning your preferences and you go, well, what does this have to do with being fulfilled, Dr. V? Michael Singer says, your problem, yo, is that in order for you to feel good, things have to be the way you want them to be on the outside. That's a problem. And Dr. V, in order for me to feel good, things have to be the way I want them to be. It cannot rain on my wedding day. It cannot rain on my birthday. Um, the train's got to run in time. There can never, ever be traffic. Um, you know, if, if, it, it, if I'm at the beach, it better not be raining. If I'm, if I'm going skiing, we better have a fresh thing of powder. You know, for, forget the fact that you're up in the mountains, it's crystal clear air, there's, you know, pine trees and, and you can jump in the hot tub and have a great time and you're with your friends and family. But the fact that there isn't any good powder there, you're, you're upset, right? Um, I found my perfect mate, Dr. V. If only he would remember to take out the garbage. If he took out the garbage every week and I wouldn't have to remind him, then I'd be happy. Sounds silly, but that's what happens. I mean, people get over arguments over this. He didn't put down the toilet. No one did the dishes. No one helps me clean the house. No one, right? So in other words, what you're saying is in order for me to be happy, my husband has to remember to take out the garbage every Monday without me, <laughs> without my reminding him. So let's say you, you remind him, he takes him out, he takes it out, and now you're still mad because you had to remind him, right? So it went from, I'd be happy if he remembered to take out the garbage, which he did, and then maybe one time he forgot and you had to remind him, and now you have a second condition. You are going to suffer all the time, you know? I will be I will be happy if my daughter makes cheerleading squad. And then not only does she have to make cheerleading squad, she has to become head cheerleader. You know, 
not my, they have to get into the best college, not just any college, but the best college. Or and then when they get into the best college, you go, oh my God, how am I going to pay for this best college? Now you're suffering again. I sure hope they get scholarships, and then they get some scholarships. But oh my God, it's not enough. We're still short ten grand. I guess they'll just go to community college, or I guess they'll just have to work. Yeah, now you're still suffering because. In order for me to feel good, Dr. B, these external things have to fall, have to happen, have to happen the way I want them to happen. Okay. You never know, because what? Uh-oh. Well, okay. YouTube projected <laughs> my comment. All right. That's good to know. If I could wave a wand. So you understand, like, you know, some of you guys are watching all over the world, different states. This, there's 100 people y'all watching on all the platforms. But do you realize that there are other parts of the world? Let's say in this, I'm in Houston, Texas. And I'll say in Paris right now. And I've been to Paris. Right? I love Paris, been to Paris a couple times actually. But there are people sitting around, I don't know what time is it in Paris right now, probably evening time, right? So they're probably having dinner because they have late dinners. They're probably sitting there at their little cute coffee shops, drinking coffee, drinking, it's, you know, they're drinking, um, you know, having a beer, a glass of wine. And I'm here in Houston doing this live. I wave this magic wand and pop, I show up in Paris and people are having wine and having dinner and having a great time. They were having dinner and a great time before I showed up into Paris. And then I wave my magic wand and pop, I'm, I leave Paris, I'm back in Houston and the people in Paris are still having a great time without me. And that's just one cafe, one street, in one city, in one country, in one part of the earth. There are trillions and trillions of things happening there are asteroids and comets and stars exploding and collapsing and and other alien life forms probably happening that we don't know anything about yet on this little planet i am suffering i have big problems well, dr v must be nice you've been to paris twice listen you're, you're missing the point mofo Two doors over, the man could be hitting his wife, and I would not know it. Three doors that way, a cat could be, like, taking her last breath. You know, five doors that way, a little kid could be drowning in their swimming pool. You know, ten doors that way could be a burglar breaking into, you know, a house and getting bitten by a dog. You know, two miles that way, a car, car accident could be happening. It's shit happening regardless of what I want. So I sit there and go, oh, in order for me to be happy, there has to be world peace? <laughs> like, what? In order for me to be happy, you know, this person has to be in office or, uh, you know, blue people have to take over, red people have to take over. Like, what? It cannot be raining. But I love to go... I love to go to the lake, Dr. B, but the lake levels are so low. Well, that's because you you say you hate it when it rains. The only way that there are the, there's enough water in the lake reservoirs is that it rains. See what I'm saying? You have these preferences. So how do you stay fulfilled, right? How do you stay fulfilled? So in the moment, right? 
So I'm sitting there. <clears throat> I'm talking to Larry, the, the suit Nazi. Like literally like no suit for you. We actually have it on video. <laughs> he actually he actually says no suit for you to us. And um, he goes, he goes, um, for a long time, I hated that phrase. Because that's all people wanted me to say. And he goes, for 10 years, I didn't say that phrase. So what's changed? He goes, now I say that phrase. I'll say it anytime anybody wants me to say it. And I go, why? He goes, I realized that's what people want. That's just what I'm known for. I was so lucky to be a part of that. I, you know, I did something that's memorable for at least a little while. It'll make people happy when I say it. It always make no one, no one's upset when I, you know, they're only upset when I don't say it. Every time I say it, they're happy. So in a way, I get to make people happy by saying one little line, no soup for you. And I'm just in there listening to him. I live it. And um, he's texting with me the next day we're leaving. I said, hey, man, I really want you to come out to the bed and breakfast. And he goes, man, Doc, it was great meeting you. And then he, he, he texted me something interesting. He goes, if you ever want to slum it to Van Nuys, I'm a Texas boy. I don't know anything about California. I thought Van Nuys is, I've heard of Van Nuys. I mean, they used to mail in shit to Van Nuys all the time. Slum it to Van Nuys. I thought Van Nuys was a nice area. Maybe I'm wrong. I remember having dinner in Van Nuys one night. It was all like it's, it's a whole strip with a bunch of restaurants and bars. Thought it was nice. If you ever slum in it, you want to slum it in Van Nuys, you can stay in my little humble 1,100 square foot home. You always have a place to stay. You know, we're family, man. That'd be such an honor. That would be such an honor to stay with you. And all you got to do is just come to the Albert flying to, to the airport. I'll pick you up. And you're VIP. You know, like I'll pick you. You don't have to do anything. You just show up. I'll have all your groceries. I'll, I'll, I'll cook for you. All the food for you. My point being is that when I was there, I was there. I wasn't trying to judge him. I wasn't trying to, you know, like flex or anything like that. So how do you be fulfilled? It doesn't matter where I find you in today's video. You might be a young student. You might, like one of our viewers, have a PhD. You might be a mentor to mentors like David Corbin. You might be, uh, quote unquote, has been like the soup Nazi. I kept trying to ask him like, what project are you working on now? He, he has a little, I can't tell you. He has a little pilot he's working on. You might be um, like Jeff Hoffman, founder of Priceline. He was on stage. He's He's got this project. He's working with Shaquille O'Neal to help heal families. He goes, you know, there's there's stuff for, for women. There's stuff for men. There's Boys and Girls Club America for kids. There's Big Brothers, Little Sisters, you know, there's there's stuff, but there's nothing for our whole family. Like once everyone goes off their individual way and have their little things, like how does it come back together? So what he and Shaquille O'Neal are doing, they're putting together a program to help these families. It's also doing another program for iPad, I don't know, all sorts of shit, right? And, um, and he's made it. He's got money. I mean, he's a billionaire. And yet, um, Eric was talking to him. We said, well, we met you a few years ago, yada, yada, yada. And Eric said, I grew up in this little town. Blah, blah. He goes, man, yeah, e here, email me. And we'd love to have you help on this. He goes, he he, he, he wanted to put, um, I'm rambling a little bit, but he has this project where he wanted to test his theory that entrepreneurs could save the world. And for one year, he cruised around the world with a boat full of entrepreneurs and then some mentors that would fly in and out. He would take them to different ports, like in India, for example, and would show them this hospital. And they get to the hospital and it's a rope with a tent over it. And the entrepreneurs go, like, when do we get to the hospital? 
And he goes, no, this is the hospital. The tent, the, like the canvas covering over a rope is the hospital. I said, what? He says, um, and he says, uh, in, in, in the, um, uh, people there are dying of like simple things like appendicitis because they have no instrumentation. They said, well, what's the problem? So we have nothing to sterilize. We can't sterilize anything. And, and obviously like if I operate on them, they're going to get infection and die. And so the entrepreneurs went back on the boat and in the next day, the 24 hours later, they had invented a machine that can sterilize equipment from common everyday parts that you can just get off the store. And they, they've like sent out hundreds of those, you know, anyway. So, so Jeff Hoffman says, we're about to do this again. You can apply. You can either be an entrepreneur or you can be a mentor and I'm going to call him. And I'm like, he goes, as, as an entrepreneur, you got to stay on the full year. And uh, as a mentor, you can come and go as you want. And I was like, well, do you have room for a surgeon, a surgeon mentor? Like I could kind of talk about that part of it. I don't know if I'm going to do that. I'm going to have my light, my, but what a great, and, oh, and he goes, oh, and we pay for everything. We fly you to the ship. We pay for everything. Like you come out of pocket, $0 for nothing. I was like, oh my God, that'd be an amazing experience. So maybe I'll do that for a month. Do you have to do something big? Like be on a hit TV show for you to be fulfilled? Do you have to be a billionaire? Oh, I remember why I was talking about Jeff Hoffman. Jeff Hoffman comes on stage and he says, um, I'm sorry, but um, I'm not doing so well. He goes, I just buried my mother yesterday. She's been sick and she goes, and he goes, I haven't slept for a week. And he said, uh, but um, I wanted to come honor Greg because, you know, Greg and I have been friends for a long time. And whenever he, he asked me, I always want to come. And he goes, and besides, my mother would, would have wanted me to, um, to honor my, my uh, commitments. And so I'm committed to Greg. So I'm, I'm here today. But just forgive me because my energy is low. I haven't slept in a week. So here's a billionaire who just buried his mom. And he's not good inside. He's very sad. He just buried his mom. So you can have a billion dollars and still be sad. You can be a part of a hit TV show and still feel inadequate and not happy to say your catchphrase. You can be a world renowned surgeon and, you know, publish 13 books and retired, you know, broke at 38, retired at 45 and still still not have a great family. We have a great family life, but you see what I'm saying, like not be happy. So I'm with all of these amazing people this last week and I'm just in the moment. I'm just going to pick up the bill and no one picks up the bill. I'm just going to be cool. Eric and I talk every day. You know, she was supposed to watch the baby last night, but I was already awake at 5.30. I don't know why. So when baby started crying at six, I ran up there Gave the baby a bottle. I didn't, I wanted Erica to sleep. I wasn't like, it's your turn to keep the baby. You see what I'm saying? And that's how you become, how you be fulfilled in life. You give up your preferences. You stay open to the moment. You realize that everything is fucking happening. There are things that are just trillions of things that are happening. And I talked about people, but like there's an earthworm over there that's having a baby. <laughs> there are ladybugs in my garden that are copulating. There's a lizard you know, in my garden that's sticking out his little th red throat trying to attract. You know, he's all sad. I can't get a partner. <laughs> it's all happening. There are squirrels running around. There is acorns dropping on my car. There's pollen dusting my car yellow green that's life people think that people mistakenly think that in order for you to be fulfilled you will you must have gotten everything you wanted the way you want it 
So I know that you're watching this because you saw the title, How to Be Fulfilled. In your head, you thought, oh, he's going to tell me how to get everything I want the way I want it. Because if, if Dr. V gives me everything I want or God gives me everything the way I want, everything I want, but not the way I wanted it, then I'll still be unhappy. It has to be the way I want it. And I'm here to tell you that's the problem. That's the problem. It has to be the way you want it. So I think if you give all that, if you give up that last part the way I want it, like Burger King, that's how you get to becoming fulfilled. Love y'all very much. Coffee with Dr. V, episode eight. If you found value in this, please hit the share button right now. I always appreciate everyone who shares. Please hit the subscribe button. I always love it when you subscribe. And as always, I will see you back next Sunday for episode number nine. Love y'all very much. Have a great day. Bye, guys.